<laughs> Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It really is an honor to to share a palabra, to share a word with the encampments in solidarity for Palestine. And it, it's, it's been pretty incredible to give teach-ins. I was at USC a couple of times. And the conversations there have been pretty incredible because a lot of what this talk is going to be about from Chiapas to Palestine has a lot to do with building the world together in a lot of ways the way these encampments have been built together. Just figuring it, figuring, figuring it out as we go along, having to figure out how people are going to get fed, how people are going to get health care, you know, how people are going to be safe, how we're going to care for each other. And so what I want to share is a history of this moment as I've witnessed it and as I've been a part of it as someone who was a student uh, when I first learned about Palestine and about the Zapatistas, who uh, is the movement that we're going to talk about today. The Zapatista movement is a rebel indigenous Maya movement, very organized movement in Chiapas, Mexico, which is the southernmost state of Mexico, right on the border with Guatemala. And something that uh, came about to me in my life as a college student when I was in my 20s was learning about the Zapatistas and about the Palestinian struggle at the same time. And this was because I was studying globalization but not the globalization like from business school, which I had studied earlier. I did an undergraduate at Cal State Northridge, shout out, at the business school because I wanted to get a job. It was the 90s, you know, and a lot of us working class students, we go to college so that we can major in something that's marketable for a job, for employment. And in the 90s, the internet was becoming more widespread and I think maybe my addiction to video games made me good at computers, but I was good at computers. And so I was able then to major in information systems, learn to code, make websites, like at a time when almost no one knew how to do that. And so it was a time where in our business classes, the answer for everything was the word globalization. So like if you know your class, your professor asked you, uh, how are you going to make some money? You know, how are you going to increase profits? We would say globalization. And that was like, oh, okay. And globalization, what that was shorthand for was we're going to move all of the labor to China or to Mexico or to other countries where labor standards are really low as our environmental standards. And that was happening in the 90s a lot. A lot of the things that we have today that are made in China, um, it's, it's everywhere, but it wasn't so everywhere back then. It was starting. And that was also something that, you know, as our professors were talking about globalization and about how globalization was the answer for everything, and by that, of course, they meant capitalist globalization. They were talking in a moment where the Soviet Union had just fallen, and that meant supposedly the triumph of capitalism all over the world now that there wasn't a competitor for, for state communism, for communism, which was like the only competitor that we were allowed to learn about when I was growing up in the 80s, and they seemed really bad. Like, we learned communism was really bad. But we didn't really know what it was, just that it was bad. And so then, as a grad student, also at Cal State Northridge, I became a, a master's student in geography because I took an urban geography class just to find out why LA was LA, like why is Compton, Compton, why is Santa Monica, Santa Monica. And I, it was the first time, probably among the, in my life, that I learned critical thinking. I hadn't been taught that in school. I went to work in class, public schools, daughter of undocumented migrants. And the schools that we go to are schools that discipline us into being workers or being incarcerated. And the Cal States, unlike the UCs, the Cal States are universities for the working class. And the UCs are universities for the managerial class. There's like a distinction of where knowledge is produced and it happens at the UCs, supposedly, and not at the Cal States or at the community colleges, much less. And so I was fascinated by geography and trying to learn about the history of Los Angeles' layout because I learned history. I learned that there was struggles, that there was like redlining, like there was actual 
federal program set up to create inequality. Uh, and I loved it so much. I was good at computers. The professor's like, you know, there's this thing called GIS. You like, you want to save the world, it sounds like. You know, you're, you're political and you're good at computers. Maybe you want to do a master's in geography. And I did, and I didn't expect to learn about Palestine or the Zapatistas there, but that's what happened because in geography, even though geography as a discipline, like so many disciplines, like anthropology, are very colonial in their histories, there are little radical pockets. And in geography, the radical pockets at the time, and this was the, now the 2000s, were uh, Marxism and feminism and anarchism. And although it, it's a small number of geographers who are the radical critical geographers, they get cited by a bunch of different other scholars and other disciplines. And so then it gives them a lot of authority because that's how academia works in terms of like knowledge production, like who cites you, who's building off of your work. And they build off of the Marxists and the feminists and the anarchist geographers a lot. And so we had to read this critical geography when we're talking about globalization. And so it was fall 2003 when I started the master's program in geography. And in one of my classes, this is the first time I ever saw the name Edward Said. He had just transitioned. He had just passed away. It was September 2003. And that was the first time I heard of him. Uh, and he's, his work is pretty canonical in geography because he talks about the geographic imagination of Europe vis-a-vis -vis the Orient. You know, it's, it's a place of, uh, that's exotic and seductive and also violent at the same time and at these tropes that the, you know, your, the European colonial mind has had about the Orient leads it to construct it in that way in its mind and it relates. So he's very canonical for this idea of geographic imaginations. And it was also in these geography classes, in particular the one on globalization, where we started to learn about the protests against capitalist globalization. And these protests against capitalist globalization were led uh, by the Zapatistas and then spread in Seattle against the World Trade Organization in 1999 and then against all of these free trade agreements that were just going to they were going to globalize capital and then curb migration and create more of Mother Earth into private property. And that was a Zapatista uprising in 1994. It was an uprising against the implementation of the North American Free Trade Agreement because it forced the Mexican government to change its constitution to no longer protect the common lands, the ejido. The ejido was the great success of the Mexican Revolution um, that was co-opted by a dictatorial revolutionary party that, that ruled for about 70 years. And the ejido was like the institutionalized common land. So common lands are lands that are not owned by anybody, but are used by the people who live there like for grazing or for planting and things change you know according to family size like communities themselves figure out the land use but nobody owns it so nobody could sell it nobody could use it as collateral to get a loan at a bank and the 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 benefit of that is that no matter if you don't have money no matter if you can't find capital income employment you will always have a place to raise your to rest your head with land you'll have techo, you know, a roof, you'll have food, you know, you, you can have community, there's always a place. And, and the thing is that we're land-based animals, and so these are very important basic necessities and material necessities of life. And so that, that for the Zapatistas, like so many movements, that the Mexican Revolution of Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa in the early 1900s had, had created the ejido and by the government and then the government took it away. That was a Zapatista uprising. And the Zapatista uprising, their first sentence to the world was, we are the product of 500 years of struggles. They understand this is 1492 to forward. And the thing about them is that they invite us to question the whole world. 
And when I think about Palestine, the only way I can make sense of the Palestinian struggle is that it's a problem of the world. It's not just even a problem of Zionism or of just the United States or of just, it, it's a problem today of the world. And this is what for the last 30 years, the Zapatistas just had their anniversary, their uprising, 30 year anniversary. This is what in the last 30 years the Zapatistas have been talking to the world about. They theorize, they philosophize, and I, I'll draw some of that out. In terms of the ways that they theorize and philosophize, they do something that's very common in Mesoamerican philosophy and indigenous cosmovisions, world, uh, ways of viewing, being in the, in the world. And that is this question of balance, balance. And this question of both positive and negative, like a yin and a yang, like Asian cultures have this, two African cultures have complementary opposites. That opposites don't have to be in competition. And in fact, they observe how difference can be powerful together in a complementary way and practice that. And so they talk about the problem of the world, that the dominant world that we live in is that difference is related to in a way that ranks people into a superior and an inferior. And this is phenotype, class, the kind of car you drive, the kind of shoes you wear, the kind of school you went to, like everything about us is ranked in some kind of hierarchy of superiority. And so it's a structure of above and below. And this is very similar to the black radical tradition that has theorized the way this figure of the human exists in the modern world. It's not homo sapiens, it's a specific kind of human the, you know, the stereotypically like white Christian male European vis-a-vis -vis the black African. So white supremacist opposite pole is anti-blackness because it's not just two differences, but differences that are ranked where to be below is to face death and destruction. And then it makes it so that we're told to go above. This is assimilation for a lot of us who are children of migrants. We know this very well. Assimilation. And that assumes sameness, that we want to reach a sameness. And what the Zapatistas do with this is, and especially the Zapatista women, they say that they don't want to be above, below. They don't want to replicate this relation of domination. So in their struggle against patriarchy, they're not trying to put the male that's above versus below. They don't want to switch it so that the males are below and the, and the non-males are above. They want to be together and side by side while still being who they are, not having to become like a man, the show that you can be patriarchal like a man, that kind of thing under the, the macho patriarchal culture. Gender in Mesoamerican philosophy is an energy. Gen the feminine is an interiority and the masculine is an exteriority. And we have both. And some of us intensify one over the other and it changes in context, there's a fluidity. There's a fluidity between the interiority and the exteriority. It, it's not these binary gender roles that are imposed. And in fact, like the binary of either or is troubled by indigenous philosophy because of this fluidity and because it seeks complementarity. So the Zapatistas critique the above and the below. And so then when it comes to struggles that they support, they support the below. They support those being crushed so that where others make their lives. And they understand that there is no one identity that is always above and always below. In other words, there isn't one identity that, that is eternally the oppressor and eternally the oppressed. They have a very famous communique from 1994 where the spokesperson, Sub Marcos, um, responded back to the machista Mexicans who are trying to delegitimize the Zapatistas 
by calling Marcos gay as if that was going to insult him. And he wrote back, yeah, Marcos is gay. Marcos is gay in San Francisco, black in South Africa, Asian in Europe, a Jew in Germany, and a Palestinian in Israel, and then keeps going. So you notice context, context shifts, right? The above and the below. And this is something that we learned from the Zapatistas is that when we're thinking about this question of injustice, and in fact, when they talk about you know, who, they're, who they struggle with, they struggle from below and to the left. For them, the left is an ethical posture against injustice. It's not a party, it's not a category, it's not a name. It's an ethical posture against injustice. And the identities in any specific context of injustice will shift. And we, we know this, especially coming from, you know, out of quote unquote decolonization, where with 1492, the world that Europe built from that was very much imagined as a world split between Europe and non-Europe. Franz Fanon talks about this as the colonial world, as a, as a world split into, or a world cut into. And he talks about like the settler, uh, the settlements versus the ghettos or like the colonized areas. And that the police is that line. The police is the line between the colonizer colonized, the above, the below, the human and the non-human. And what we saw with decolonization was that there were so many movements trying to figure out liberation, but the only one that we hear about is the one where some of the below became representatives and heads of nation states in Africa and the Americas and Asia, right? And, and continue that order of above versus below. And notice that this is a power flow. Above and below, the above makes their lives at the expense of the below. Whether crushing, extracting, eliminating, Right, there is, uh, there, there is in, in any case, an extractive type of power relationship, an energy suck. And the problem that we're living in since so-called decolonization is that we're being taught that the way we get free is by going above, that we need some of us to go above. Some of the wretched, like the talented 10th is usually how it's called. Um, but what happens with that is if we go above, we need a below. And that is an unethical position because making one's life at the expense of another's life is not an ethical position. And this is a lot about ethics. That's why like, when the Zapatistas talk about struggle, they talk about worlds. Like what is your metaphysics? What is your, how do you understand the cosmos? How do you understand the world being? What is, you know, what is, you know, what do you value? truth, you know, or, or those kinds of big ethical political questions. And so when we have an above and below structure, and we, we see then that that is a structure for so many of the relationships that hurt us, that harm us, like patriarchy, male above, non-male below, citizenship, citizen above, non-citizen below. And this one, this one actually shows the dangers of even having a standard for equality. Citizenship is a standard for equality. When there is a standard for equality introduced, sorry, when there's a standard for equality introduced, inequality is introduced at the same time. The Zapatista women say we are equal because we're different meaning that they begin with the assumption that there's no standard, we're already equal. And difference, difference, their, their worldview is a collective, a collective but not of sameness, like with the Soviet Union, like when people think about communism, they think about the, they think about the Soviet Union as everybody being the same, everybody getting the same redistribution. You have to live the same way, be the same way, which then for many makes capitalism more attractive because you can be an individual, right? There's that, there's that, but then there's like no collectivity. It's like two extremes. 
they talk about the collective and the collective itself because it values difference. It makes it so that you can be your most unique self. Not just an individual that's isolated from community, but like your actual self, who you are, be yourself. So much of the struggle is about what kind of people you know, we want to be. And so when we think about this, then the above and below, there's a world where power can flow above and below and a world where power can flow side by side. And, and just to make that a little bit more concrete, when we look at plants, when we look at society's relationships with food growing, I'm from Oxnard, and if maybe you've driven through, you've seen the fields, right? All the agricultural fields. And the fields are all perfect rows, and they all have one crop. They're monocrops. And that crop has to look the same, be the same size, to be efficient in cutting, you know, and, and going through machines. And carrots have to be the same size so that schools can accept them so that they can be cut through their machines. So, like, it's about creating sameness in the food, in the way that food is grown, and also competing. That's why there's all this herbicide and pesticide. Every other life around that plant is understood as a competitor. And so they have to be killed. They have to be cited. In distinction to this type of food growing is the milpa, the three sisters, the Native American way of growing corn, beans, and squash together. Three very, very different plants. Talk about difference. This is an example of we're powerful because of our difference, not in spite of our difference, and I'll illustrate. The milpa with the maiz, with the corn, the stalk is very, very long. That's like the centerpiece of a lot of, well, the Maya, the Maya are people of the maiz. A lot of Native people understand that as a symbiotic being. To plant corn, corn, maiz, takes a lot of nutrition from the soil. Okay, so then you all, the milpa also has beans. And beans need a trellis for support, and the tall corn stalk supports the beans. And what does the bean do? The bean's superpower is to get from the air, magically, nitrogen, and fixes it in the soil. So the nutrition that the corn extracts, the beans help put back in. They support each other. And then there's the squash. The squash is a low-lying, crawling plant with really big leaves that cover the soil to protect the soil. So the corn is known as the leader, the beans are known as the giver, and the squash as a protector. Everybody has their role, kind of like this camp, right? Kind of like these struggles. Everybody's got their role. That's an example of cooperation and difference being a power, not a weakness. That is closer to the worldview of struggles like the Zapatistas and many other Native American traditions and struggles today. And that's really important for us to at least know about because we're not really taught about a possibility outside of the above and the below. All of our lives in schools, this is so prevalent in our lives, we're ranked A, B, C, D, F. We're ranked, there's a standard, it's you know, the, the top student. And not everybody learns the same. You know, by the, in, in, in elementary school, uh, I understand now like the, th that we had very different learning, l l uh, ways of learning, and that schools needed to just go to the lowest common denominator and cater to one that was more efficient. I mean, teachers are so overwhelmed too. It's like a systemic problem. And so a lot of people don't get valued for being intelligent even though we are all intelligent. We're all equally intelligent, just we have very different skills and different knowledges and different gifts. You know, it's a way of understanding gifts. So it's, it's a worldview that's important to know about to at least make the dominant world look strange. Just strange, you know? I have my ideas about it, but at least if we can make it strange and not just normal. And the thing is, is that for a lot of people, this might, just that this might be human nature. You know, a lot of people say it's, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there. You know, you're either at the table or you're on the menu. This goes around in politics a lot. 
you're either at the table or you're on the menu. It's this binary of eat or be eaten, conquer or be conquered. And when, when we become threatened, I mean, these are existential questions of survival. This is like the logic of empire, the last 500 years all over th these lands and on the globe that movements have been trying to fight off with these other worlds, with these other circulations of power, these other cosmovisions. The Zapatistas call the struggle a world where many worlds fit. Not just a world where everybody can live, a world that respects difference, a, a world where many worlds fit. So I, I usually ask people rather than like their ideology or their religion or I ask them, how can we share the world together with our difference? Right? How can we share the world together with our difference? And that requires that we all step up as thinkers, which we are. Philosophers, all of us are daily philosophers. Like, we don't always have time to think of ourselves that way. But critical thought, critical thought, the way I define that term, critical thought is about questioning assumptions. It's not about, I don't like this, or I don't like that. It's about the assumptions. The assumptions of, one of the great assumptions of the dominant world is eat or be eaten. Is you're above or you're below. And that's it, it's like a closed possibility. And maybe a lot of people haven't, maybe they believe that because they haven't seen anything else, they haven't felt anything else. That's why these movements are so important that do this. Because you can witness it and, you, and more importantly, you can feel it. I talk about like when I go to Zapatista territory, it feels different. And I kind of like provoke people. I say, you know, there's no white people that go to Zapatista territory. And they're like, yeah, there are. I see pictures all the time. I'm like, oh yeah, they're just white adjective though. They're not white, I'm the boss. Like, there's, like, no reward for walking in, like, you know everything you're going to take over, like, Columbus seeing something, you know? There's no reward for that. You don't get canceled. You're just not rewarded. And, like, you can make mistakes. People will come and tell you, you know, very lovingly. You know, the way things go around here kind of is a little bit different. It's a different feeling. And the way that power flows in Zapatista territory is through mandar obedeciendo, which is to lead by obeying. And there are seven principles that are, that are like, convince, don't defeat. Propose, don't impose. Go below, don't go above. Like, don't ever try to be superior to anybody else kind of thing. They have seven others. Ser serve, don't serve yourself. And this is people who are in a le leadership position need to obey the people who organize in a, as an assembly. They, they have a, a military, the Zapatistas, an army that is hierarchical and they recognize it's a problem because that's, first of all, they say that we're not true humans, those of us who are soldiers, because we have a weapon and to have a weapon means that might equals right and that's not to be a full human. And we want a world where we don't have to be soldiers anymore, where we can be who we need to be. But right now we have to fight. We're fighting for a world where there are no more armies. You know, our annihilation as a, as a military force would be our victory. We don't want to be a military force. You know, so they have these ideas, these ethical, political ideas of what is a true human. Right, and recognizing that there are contexts where we can't be that, but we need to fight for who we want, for the world where we can be who we need to be. So with the Zapatistas in Palestine, this is something that I, I like sharing, this process of how I learned about the Palestinians because of their struggle and because they were so linked in these movements in the 90s and the 2000s with the ultra-globalization movement that was critiquing capital. And I mentioned that it's, and, and I mentioned that I like sharing this story because it's not one that I heard in the university. So after I did my master's at Cal State Northridge, which I did on Guatemalan transnationalism, like a transnationalism from below, 
uh, I decided to to do it. Uh, my I decided to do a PhD and study the border of Mexico, Guatemala, where my ancestral family's from, and was cut between the border, the other uh, Maya mom. And I was also so I was seeing EZLN everywhere, and I found out that was the Zapatistas, and I also wanted like Chiapas is the border of Mexico, Guatemala. I wanted to learn more about them. And um, I was active against, you know, against the war in Iraq. A lot of us protested millions all over the world, and it was so ineffective. A lot of us got our heart broken and decided that instead of mobilizing, we needed to organize. And we were, we were then trying to learn from other movements, and we learned a lot from the Black Panthers and the Zapatistas together. And I also was learning about you know, free Palestine, and I was like, wow. Because like to me, that was something that I really needed to figure out on my own, because I had learned about Anna Frank when I was nine, and I, that's when I learned about the Holocaust, and I was so traumatized, and I learned then about Israel, as like, everything is fine now, Israel exists, and I was like, oh, okay, you know, that's good. But I didn't know, I hadn't known for many years how Israel had been created. It was around 9-11, a little bit before 9-11. It was a second intifada. I was watching the news and they were like, it was like, I think maybe CNN or one of those corporate media outlets where they had like people arguing. And there was a, a woman uh, arguing in support of the Palestinians and she managed to say, but the Palestinians are suffering. And, and then they cut her off. And then that kind of made me be like, whoa, I thought that they were bad guys. You know, I thought they hated us, all that stuff in the news. And then after 9-11, after 9-11, a lot of us took a foreign policy course. Like all the university foreign policy courses were packed right after 9-11. And, you know, that's where I learned about, you know, I, I, to be critical of the state, I hadn't really thought about it before that, you know, our professor said that the that there's no such thing as friends in politics, in international state politics. There's only allies. States exist only to preserve themselves as states. They're not there for the people. That's secondary. Primarily, they're there to preserve themselves as states. And I started then also, Wiki, I, I used Wikipedia to, to try to figure out what's going on in Palestine. And it was a time when Wikipedia had just come out. And there had already been a, a debate that had been settled because Encyclopedia Britannica was getting pissed off at this free encyclopedia that people could, you know, it was trying to delegitimize it by saying that it has so many errors. And then there was a study that found that Britannica and Wikipedia have the same amount of errors. And then like no one talks about Britannica no more. You know, and so Wikipedia, like there wasn't social media. This was like mid 2000s or early 2000s, mid 2000s. And I, I learned there how Israel had been created. And I thought the whole world was lying to me. It, it was really devastating. And I didn't know who to trust. I started to read a lot of things on the internet and was so confused. And it was a moment that forced me to figure out what my ethical what my political ethics was going to be, what my own values was going to be. And I decided to backpack Palestine. I was backpacking between the master's program and the PhD program. I went backpacking to some parts around the world, and I found that there had been in the past single women travelers in the region, in Lebanon, you know, Syria. I was like, whoa, right? So then I did it. And that was in 2005, 2006, that winter. And I just was there in Palestine for like three days in Jerusalem and then Bethlehem. I had been studying photography and had learned through my photography class about the, the siege on the Church of the Nativity. There's a church in Bethlehem where they say Jesus of Nazareth was born. There's like a little star in a cave. Lots of pilgrims go. And there had been Palestinians that during the Second Intifada had taken shelter there and Israel besieged it for weeks and was shooting at anyone in the church. Yeah, and, and I learned that in my photography class, not in my regular classes, just because there had been a photographer there and stuff. 
So I wanted to see that, and I wanted to see this new wall that was being erected. I was hearing about this wall, which we know now is the apartheid wall, and it's right at Bethlehem. And I was racially profiled by the Israelis. I, in Palestinians, I saw a lot of my own community, just like kids running around, like, it was really nice. Like, the vibes were really, really familiar. As were the vibes of the Israelis that I met, who sound, who the way they talk about Palestinians was really gross, you know, and, and, and it reminded me of this place, like, you know, before political correctness, which is gone now for some people. And so I decided to, um, well, then that summer I was in Chiapas. I was deciding to do, you know, my dissertation on the Mexico Guatemala border and um, Israel bombs the airport in Beirut. This is summer of 2006. And I'm watching CNN and Espanol in Chiapas and looking at CNN in English on my laptop. And the coverage is so different. It was indoctrination on CNN in English. And in CNN in Espanol, they had for an hour a professor from Argentina give a whole history. And I was like, we don't get history with the mainstream media. I started to see the two different realities. And I, I imagine maybe a lot of folks are feeling that, like seeing like social media telling you something and then the mainstream news. Some, like that was my feeling back then. And, it, and it's, it's a serious mindfuck. You know, like who are you gonna trust now, right? So I couldn't stop thinking about Palestine after that. I just felt the whole world had lied to me. And eventually I ended up changing my entire dissertation research to Palestine so I could like just go and learn everything I could. And I did a, a dissertation on the borders of Palestine on the map that we always use. Cause I know like borders and I can talk more about that, but mostly I bring it up uh, because I, I noticed something important there that I'd like to share. And one is that I had moved from Latin American studies to Middle East studies and noticed that they don't talk to each other. Latin American studies was talking a lot about neoliberalism and anti-capitalism and Middle East studies was talking about Islam and the hijab and didn't talk about capitalism. And I also then noticed that the way that Palestine was being talked about was as if it was just something between Jews and Palestinians that started in 1948. You know, and eventually through years of trying to also like tie in like why I cared so much, like why, like what does this history have to do with me? Uh, all of that ended up making me go back to 1492. 1492, and not just October 12th, January 2nd. January 2nd, 1492, was in the Iberian Peninsula, that same Queen Isabella that would, you know, underwrite Columbus's voyage. In that same Iberian Peninsula, the last stronghold of the Muslim world had surrendered, Granada. The Alhambra, there's a castle named Alhambra, that Alhambra, the city is named after over here. And it was like a huge victory for the Catholic monarchs because it was the ethnic cleansing of the Iberian Peninsula, immediately ethnic cleansing of Jews and, and of Islam. So whereas Jews and Muslims and Christians were living together after that, the Iberian Peninsula uh, started to force Jews to leave or to convert and then was suspicious of the ones who converted and had the Spanish Inquisition and tortured confessions out of them. And there's a torture museum still in Granada that shows the ways that they did that. And Columbus was there in Granada waiting for it to surrender. And after it surrendered, he was able to talk to Queen Isabella to tell her about his plan to go west. And an enormous reason why they wanted to go west was to get Jerusalem next after Granada. And this isn't something we're taught a lot of the time. We're taught that he was just greedy and wanted money, but he was uh, very apocalyptic like Isabella. He believed that the world was going to end in 155 years and needed to go west to then hook up with the empires in the west and then, you know, crush 
the Islamic empires. Uh, and so when I was doing my research on Palestine's borders, that iconic shape that we know, that iconic shape was created by evangelical Christians in the 19th century from the United States and from Great Britain. Christian Zionism is far bigger than Jewish Zionism, even today, even today. And we saw like in the congressional hearings against um, the faculty and students at Columbia that one of the Congress members was even saying that, you know, people think that Washington DC is the center of the universe, but I think Jerusalem is the center of the universe. If you look at medieval European maps of the world, Jerusalem is in the center. And then there's the three continents, Africa, Asia, Europe. And even, like it's still, even though the modern world likes to think of itself as secular, like the West likes to think of itself as secular, it still understands that Jerusalem is a part of its creation story. And what a lot of the apocalyptic evangelicals who read the Bible literally rather than allegorically, metaphorically, they believe in, this, in the rapture, that Jews have to go back to Jerusalem, build the third temple, and then Jesus can come back. Every time I tell this story, I feel like people don't believe me because it really sounds out of this world. But it's, it's, so, it, it's very prevalent in, um, in the US culture. And in fact, George W. Bush himself was one of these evangelical Christians that even called the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq a, new, a crusade. And they had to tell him, don't use that word. Well, they believe that, the, that Jews need to go back to Jerusalem, genocide everybody, the Palestinians, because that's what happened in the book of Joshua, as they say. And, and then Jesus will come back. Everybody's going to have to become Christian to be saved. And if not, they're going to die in a hellfire, including Jews. So it's a very anti-Semitic um, prophecy. So like a, a lot of Zionism needs anti-Semitism. Zionism is not a solution for and against anti-Semitism. It needs it because that's the point of its entire existence. So like, what we're seeing with the response of October 7 is, is this, 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 this project called Israel, and Israel is a state, which means that it's an instrument of force. It's a monopoly of violence. Review another day. Love you so much. I don't know how to. Yes.